Here, one question for technology boosters. That's you, by the way. Maybe the crucial one is why, during the decades of the personal computer and the internet, the American economy has grown so slowly, average wages have stagnated, the middle class has been hollowed out, and inequality has surged. Why has a revolution that is supposed to be as historically as important as the Industrial Revolution coincided with a period of broader economic decline? I posed the question in one form or another to everyone I talked to in the Bay Area. That's the San Francisco Bay Area, obviously. <laughs> the answers became a measure of how people in the technology industry think about the world beyond it. Few of them had given the topic much consideration. One young techie wondered if it was really true. Another said that the problem was a shortage of trained software engineers. A third noted that the, tech that the focus of the tech industry was shifting from engineering to design and suggested that this would open up new job opportunities. So George, I'd like you to tell everybody in your words what your problem with Silicon Valley is exactly. <laughs> That's a non sequitur. <laughs> I don't find a, a problem with it in that. I find more of a question. And the question was, how does Silicon Valley see the broader economy, the broader country, uh, politics, government? I mean, those were the, the big themes of that piece. I mean, I grew up in Silicon Valley before it was Silicon Valley. I probably uh, was there before just about anybody in this room. And, you know, I was struck upon going back to my home for this piece by the vast transformations of it. It was a pretty boring uh, middle class place when I was growing up. Uh, everybody I knew went to public school. The differences were not vast between people of different backgrounds. Um, and it's easy to be nostalgic about your youth, but it had a kind of egalitarian quality that I found in keeping with you know, certain values of American democracy. And today, it has become this fabulous success story. The cars in the Stanford Shopping Center are no longer Datsuns and Pintos. Uh, you know, they're Infinities, they're uh, Audis. And at the same time, you know, unemployment, it, has become a serious problem. Uh, you name it. You guys know better than I do. Um, this, this, look, this will happen at 10:45 at night when all of us yeah, have, have yeah. been drinking. So we're keep gonna, going. We're, this will be not an interview, but a fugue chat. Keep going. Um, <laughs> to retract my article. <laughs> Because a, a talk that I missed said that it was not accurate. Keep um, going. Stay focused. Right, right, right. <laughs> I wanted to find out how the industry, because when you say Silicon Valley, we're talking about an industry, saw itself in relation to the country and to politics. And I found some interesting things, and not all of them were bad things. I mean, one thing I found was there's this whole new impetus to get involved in bigger issues than simply the narrow tech-related issues that used to animate uh, Silicon Valley's relationship with Washington. For example, Mark Zuckerberg's new advocacy group, Forward.us, which is all about not just immigration reform, but I think the long-term project uh, is to get involved in other big issues that will, as Joe Green said to me, um, bring more and more Americans into the knowledge economy. I mean, that's the crux of the matter. We've got this huge revolution that's changed everybody's life. I carry the damn iPhone around everywhere I go. I was on a bike today in beautiful Aspen, Colorado, looking at my email. Why was I doing that? You know, <laughs> because you can. Because, because I can and because you know, I've been the victim of the snake oil salesman of Silicon Valley who, uh, who know what we want. And people, it's changed the world, but it has not changed standards of living across the country. And you go anywhere in America other than the prosperous centers of creativity and technology, and you feel that they're living in a completely different world. And I felt this sense you, of- you, you feel that this, people in Silicon Valley are living in a completely different and, world. And people in Youngstown, Ohio are living in a completely different world from Silicon Valley. There really are 
at least to Americas, and that's a very worrying thing, and I didn't feel a sense of awareness and urgency about it in Silicon Valley, and why would they? Because it's done so well. But you, you, before we go to the government aspect, you make a larger point, which is there was a time where you could argue that the innovations that came out of Silicon Valley truly changed the world. The microprocessor, for example. And uh, the, pro the, 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 cha the innovations that are coming out of the valley today, in your yeah. opinion, simply aren't. You wrote the hottest tech startups are solving all the problems of being 20 years old with cash on hand because that's who thinks them up. And that's been the most quoted line in the, in the piece. And it was a bit of a throwaway. Uh, are we having audio trouble? A little bit of feedback. Um, it, it was a bit of a throwaway, but I think it, it got repeated as often as it did because it hit a nerve. And I think maybe the piece itself hit a nerve. Um, you know, so I was talking to a, a very experienced person from Silicon Valley just this evening, and I asked him, what was the last company that really achieved a breakthrough in engineering and in technology that you know you could say it actually changed the course you know of the history of technology in Silicon Valley and he said Genentech and then he said maybe Google but it does suggest that there was a period this don't take this analogy too far but Silicon Valley is a bit like Renaissance Florence you have this concentration of incredible talent and ambition and competitiveness in a very small place. Everyone doing similar things in the same world. And they make each other better and they feed off each other and they compete with each other and kill each other off and win and lose. And it creates this tremendous fertility, which has been the tech revolution in Silicon Valley. But like Renaissance Florence, these things have a way of evolving from the sort of the innovative period or the, the truly sort of groundbreaking period where people are discovering new things to a kind of decadence where you're actually refining things to a smaller and smaller degree that have actually been discovered a long time ago. And so I don't want to say for sure Silicon Valley is entering its mannerist uh, period for those of you who know your art history, but there is a little bit to me of a suggestion of people solving problems that don't need to be solved. Uh, and people uh, finding narrower and narrower ways to try to reach the, you know, the other side of the rainbow. And it's worse than that in your telling, which is, I think we want to get you a new microphone. Ah. Not only, am I still, am I still at, not only are you suggesting that people are solving problems that don't need to be solved, you're also suggesting they're extremely satisfied with themselves for doing it, in part because they're making a lot of money doing it. And something about that rubs you the wrong way, and I'd like, to, I'd like you to, to explain that. I don't think I ever, in the piece or elsewhere, said they should not be making as much money as they're making. Um, well, there's something wrong with all the fancy cars at the Stanford Shopping Center and the fact that not everybody there's, goes to public school in Palo Alto anymore. There's something wrong with anymore. privilege without responsibility. And there's something wrong with success without a sense of its connection or lack thereof to the rest of the country. Um, now this is giving me a different kind of feedback. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is hopeless. Yeah, we can live with this better. Okay. Maybe it just doesn't like what I'm saying. <laughs> 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 so, where were we? we were, oh, yeah, pr privilege media. without responsibility. Yeah. I mean, yeah, noblesse oblige is actually underrated. It, <laughs> it's what, um, noblesse oblige is what used to animate, um, and this is actually part of what the unwinding is about, used to animate business leaders who felt a sense of obligation, or at least a sense that their own business interests couldn't be pushed too hard without acknowledging the ways in which they were pushing against other people's interests, whether it's consumers, workers, government, etc. So there was a labor business government uh, kind of peace that reigned for a while and that required people at the top of each of those to know each other, to work with each other, to not see each other simply as combatants. Um, and to acknowledge that, you know, maybe it, it's sunny here, but it's raining over here. I don't see very much of that anymore. And Silicon Valley has a, a particular responsibility. It is the part of the country that has 
done the, the best in this 35 year period of the unwinding, as I call it in my book. It's the part of the country other than Wall Street that has seen real growth, real success, real wealth generation, while other industries in other parts of the country have been stagnant. And that carries, I think, a, a, a weight, a, a burden uh, of responsibility that I think Silicon Valley is beginning to wake up to. I think forward.us is one good sign in that direction. But all I was doing was asking you know, these questions about well, how do you see inequality and how do you see economic stagnation? And most of the answers were either huh or why is that our problem? We're making wonderful things that are changing the world. Why are you asking me that? And in your opinion, is Silicon Valley making things that are changing the world? Yeah, I mean, if you consider changing the world, you know, getting me to stop my bike ride to look at my email, of course. Uh, and there are other things that are more serious than that that are happening. In the third world, for example, the way mobile phones have made it easier for you know, farmers and fishermen to, to market their, their goods, of course it's changing the world. I think that that phrase is too easily used, though, as if anything that is a tech success is a, is a global success and is good for humanity. I don't think technology is, by definition, uh, always in the interest of humanity. And you, you, you seem... I guess the logical, con con conclu the logical conclusion of your point that whereas the industrial revolution, both industrial revolutions, raised up the, ma the global macro economy, the technology revolution of the past, pick your period, I don't know if you want to say five years, 15 years, 30 years, I mean, I go back not. to the personal computer as, okay, as so the 30, point where 30 or so yeah, 30, years. 30, 35, the Apple II, you could say. So is it's saying, it, you're saying it has not. So you are making the case that the technology revolution has not had the impact that the industrial revolution has. And why not? Why do you think it hasn't? Well, you know, one answer is not yet. Uh -huh. Just wait. We're at the beginning. That would be is, the optimistic. It uh, would. And this is going to take a long time. And you have no idea, you know, what kind of economic transformation is going to be possible. Um, another answer which I heard from that same sage um, Silicon Valley wise man today was because these are job killing uh, businesses, not job creating businesses. So now you're really getting into controversial territory because George, George, everybody in this room knows that, t that, that the technology industry creates jobs. You're right. not saying it kills jobs, are you? Except for that guy who said it to me earlier uh, who isn't in this room, but who <laughs> who kind of knows what he's talking about. Um, obviously, they create some jobs and they kill other jobs. When you think about the market cap of a company like Facebook and how many people it employs, it's pretty hard to make the claim that uh, social media companies are, are the, the equivalent of General Motors. It's moving in the other direction. Okay, but so, and, I, and I'm gonna move on in a moment to the unwinding, but to that specific point, let me ask the, you know, the extremely intellectual question, so what? I mean, is that, is that, whose fault is that? Is that Facebook's fault? Is it Silicon Valley's fault? And I guess more importantly, what should we as a polity do about it? That's not a, an easy question to answer. Um, I mean, so what? Well, in a way, yes, yeah, so what? If Silicon Valley didn't sign up to be a, a jobs program, and it didn't sign up to be a, uh, an immigration reform program or to solve all of our other social problems? That's kind of one of the answers I heard. Well, if that's the case, then stop saying that this is going to be good for you and that this is all about improving human life across the board. In other words, you can have it one way or the other, but you can't say on the one hand, we're changing the world, and on the other hand, why is it our problem if America is falling into decline and somehow the engine of little Silicon Valley isn't big enough to pull it out of the ditch. So Very good. Yep. I, I would say, you know, you have to be honest about, you know, what you're actually claiming for yourself. Um, I don't have the answer to your last question. I mean, if I did, I would be, you know, Tom Friedman, <laughs> not, not, not George Packer. I mean, I, you I, know what? I, we didn't invite Tom Friedman. Well, to, he, to, to he would have been great to have. I mean, he's, got, he's a guy with a lot of ideas. I am not, I, I am not a, uh, a prognosticator or really a pundit. I'm an observer and a writer, and what I've tried to do in that piece and also in The Unwinding, which I hope we'll talk about, is to, to paint a picture of how I see 
the world we live in. So I want to I want to tell all of you. <laughs> and so I you was quoting her ironically, but you can put it on me if you have to. <laughs> These are people who, uh, aside from you, you also wrote about Oprah Winfrey and Jay Z and um, Newt Gingrich and Robert Rubin and Andrew Breitbart and but in addition public to them, figures. You wrote about some people whose lives have been, you know, just just gut wrenchingly affected by the the trends in the macro economy. And I want to ask you what 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 your overall goal was with these these beautiful and very, I think, very sad narratives in your book. Well, they're not all sad in the sense that they're not all stories of struggle and hardship because Peter Thiel is a major character in the book. And as most people here probably know, Peter Thiel's done pretty well over the last 15 years. Um, there's another character from Washington who goes from Capitol Hill to being a lobbyist and then back to Capitol Hill, and he's done quite well. So there are these places where People are thriving, but I found his story incredibly sad. <laughs> his story maybe, is sad. Maybe that's me. Because what, no, it's not yeah. you. Because Washington is sad. Yeah. Washington is so sad. I got out of Union Station a few weeks ago and just immediately felt this paralysis settling over me. Like I could hardly take a step. I just felt nothing happens here. Nothing gets solved. You, the, what's the point of of even <laughs> getting off the train and going to my first interview? Um, <clears throat> But he's really very optimistic. <laughs> no, that's just Washington. Um, it's 3,000 miles from where you guys are. Um, no, there, there are, I would say the two most important people in the book are a woman named Tammy Thomas, who uh, grew up in Youngstown, Ohio, a steel town. And her story coincides with deindustrialization and sort of the, the, the problems of the Rust Belt. She ends up raising her three kids on one of the last factory jobs in Youngstown, an auto parts factory that, that then ships the job to Mexico, declares bankruptcy and, and takes away half her pension. She then has to find a new way to live and she becomes a community organizer. And the other is a guy named Dean Price who's just a complete original. There, it's, it's very hard to see what category fits in. He's a North Carolinian who's the son of a Bible Belt preacher uh, his father was a failed preacher, and Dean grew up wanting to escape sort of the shadow of poverty and failure of his father. And he started a chain of truck stops and fast food restaurants uh, between Greensboro, North Carolina, and Martinsville, Virginia. That began to fail, and then it, sort of at a moment of crisis, he thought, I have to do something different. And he began to realize it was all around him in the fallow tobacco farms and the waste oil thrown out by all the restaurants, it was biodiesel fuel, which he could, which can be made locally. And he began to have a whole vision of how this countryside that had begun to fall into neglect could be resurrected by the green economy. So Dean Price and Tammy Thomas are these quintessentially American characters who struggle and fail and get knocked down over and over again and don't give up. But it's not a, it's not a purely you know, cheerful sort of you can do it if you try story either. I would agree with that. Basically what I wanted to do was to create a big canvas going from Silicon Valley to Wall Street, Washington to North Carolina, Tampa uh, to Youngstown, and to show what's happened in the country over the past generation and how we have become both in, in many ways more free and have many more choices and in other ways less fair and more stratified. And I will also tell everybody, I, I read a lot of things about the mortgage crisis over the last five years, and I haven't read anything as good as George's depiction of what happened to people in Tampa, Florida, in the, in the mortgage crisis. Let's have a few questions. Raise your hand, please. We have a roving mic. I want to plead with you to make your questions very brisk. Where's the mic? OK, there, it's way back there, so it's going to make its way through the chairs to you and to you, sir, in the, in the blue sport coat. Here it comes. Just tell us who you are. That's our, yeah, that's Maddie, our thing. Medi Max and your CEO of Rafter. Um, uh, don't you have a, a sort of a systemic problem in the U.S. economy right now where you got manufacturing going global? So you're um, eliminating uh, poverty in China. And then you have an innovation engine that in proportion to the globalization movement is one-tenth of its size. So Silicon Valley is about maybe 20 to 40 billion of value creation on an annual basis, where the, the movement of manufacturing to China is you know, almost 200 to 300 billion on an annual yeah. basis. Yeah, that's absolutely right. That's the, the engine of Silicon Valley isn't big enough to pull this, 
rusty old truck out of, out of the ditch into which it's driven. And, and you're right about that. And maybe it will as innovation spreads to other parts of the country and as it spawns new industries, et cetera. All I was trying to point out in that article was right now we have two things going on at once. We have this fabulously successful sector and we have uh, a broad sort of majority of Americans whose economic lives are stuck. Uh, if not sinking. And there's a certain utopianism that I find in Silicon Valley that doesn't take the latter into account. Um, you just made a very realistic, clear-eyed point about you know, the economic trends and which way they're going, but this thing is, <laughs> clearly I'm not much of a tech guy. Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, as I said, you can't have it both ways. You can't then claim that it's, Anyway, that th I made the point early, you get it. We have one right up here. Where's the mic? Coming, coming, coming. So I grew Tell us up- who you are, please. Uh, Dave Morgan from Simo Media, a startup entrepreneur. I grew up in, in Western Pennsylvania, Northern Appalachia, and um, hmm. where we never had unemployment under 20% as far as I ever remembered. I never saw a help wanted sign. I'm a little dis concerned because you throw water on a bright light and I think that's one of the things we actually need to pull the rest of the country with in places that it's not easy and it's not happening and innovation is not part of things and the steel industry and the unions and a whole bunch of things conspire to kill many hundreds of thousands and millions of jobs and so to blame Silicon Valley for not being perfect in some ways says we were doing it well before and we weren't doing it well before. And that to me is it's actually a bright light mm -hmm. that's spreading to a lot of so places. So if I could paraphrase your question, you're saying rather than criticize Silicon Valley, what we need is to get some of that Silicon Valley goodness to the Western Appalachia. Go yeah, ahead. Exactly. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Or Pennsylvania, we can call it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've spent some time there too. So I would just say, you know, well, do you really need to be told you're perfect? I mean, isn't Silicon Valley grown up enough now that it can take a little bit of criticism or a little bit of scrutiny? I mean, have you been so flattered by, you know, by, by tech writers in the question. Bay Area? That was not what I asked. No, he's right. His, his question is, w w if, you, if we want to advocate something, perhaps we could advocate the spirit of innovation in parts and of the country should. that don't have And it. we should. But what I would add is, we also have to have a pretty sober sense of how hard it is and how many factors are working against innovation. Because sometimes when I read the more utopian writing about tech, it suggests that as soon as we just educate the rest of the country, and education is this magic word that is used to solve all these problems, and as soon as we get government out of the way and unions out of the way and bring in you know, all the ingredients that have created innovation in places like Silicon Valley and other parts of the country, it'll happen there. Well, it doesn't happen very easily. It takes, you know, these places are so sunk into economic problems, social problems, generational problems, that most people leave who have ambition because they don't see the potential in their they, own place. They can't leave, the point is they... All right, we're gonna, we, we, because we're running short on time, we're gonna have one more there. Two more questions, one there and one over there. Great, go, right there. Thank you. Is it on? Okay, good. So You're on. What I always hate I'm in sorry, the tell us who you are. My name is Axel Tillman from the Russian Venture Company. Uh -huh. What I always hate is the focus on just Silicon Valley. Did you realize that Boston, New York is equally as strong as Silicon Valley at, the, at this point in time? Right. I'm living in all three ecosystems and I have actually driven around the country. I agree with you, middle America is a very difficult point. I mean, 100 miles west of Boston, you go to a gas station, you ask for a Wall Street Journal and say, what is this? But, but because but, it's late, we need to make it a question. Right. Quick. But, but the question is that I think there's enough happening in this country and we should be actually very proud of what we are doing. Why do you see this negative point of view as you have portrayed? I believe we are up to the next level of what we can create in this country. So tell me why you have a negative well, I about think it's it. a complicated picture. I mean, my, if, if my book is, is part of this discussion, I hope it is, um, 
Peter Thiel in Silicon Valley, which is also a term used to describe the tech world. I couldn't go everywhere in the world. I went to Silicon Valley, the physical place. Peter Thiel is part of the story because that, that success and that innovative spirit is a key part of what's happened in America over the last 30 years. But there's a great swath of America that isn't seen much by the media and isn't seen much by um, entrepreneurs and by the people who support them and by the venture capitalists who invest in them, which is there whether we like it or not. And not to acknowledge it and to take it into account and to see why it sunk into the place where it is and how much government has to do with that, how much Wall Street has to do with that. I mean, we're, we're sort of stuck on Silicon Valley here, but my book goes, that's, that's one piece of a much larger puzzle, um, is to, to not grapple with reality. I mean, all I'm trying to do is create a picture that shows people how I think the country is today. To do that, you have to go to Stokesdale, North Carolina. You have to go to Youngstown, Ohio. As a metaphor, is what you mean. Because there's any number of places you There can. are many Stokesdales, just as there are many Silicon Valleys. Okay. We have one last question. Do you have the microphone already? Really, really quick. Tell Good us time. who you are. Get Brian, I don't Brian think you're on. From Jeffries. There you go. Go. Hello, hello, hello. Do you hear me? Brian Pitts from Jeffries. Just a really quick question on your growth premise. premise. When I pull up uh, a chart here on GDP for the past 51 years, the slope of the line for the past 30 years is significantly steeper than the 20 years previous to that. So what, what are your assumptions in terms of the real growth when you say that growth is actually not as good as it was in I'm, the industrial revolution? I'm talking revolution? more about growth of wages, uh, growth of middle class wages. No, I don't think so. I think GDP is a very misleading measure because it's so badly distributed. So just wages alone? Well, this is, this, is the, this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about slow growth. And I don't think, I think most Americans will know what I mean when I say middle class wages, middle class incomes, and the economic life of the majority of Americans has been stuck for a long time. Was it better in the Industrial Revolution? Was, I think, that, was that disparity better or worse than now? I think there was a period in the later part of the industrial, call it you know, the consolidation, the flowering of the Industrial Revolution, which I call the Roosevelt <laughs> Republic, about a 50-year period from the Great Depression to the 70s, when there was more prosperity shared more widely and more security uh, for ordinary people, and in which institutions like corporations, government, schools, media, actually supported the aspirations of ordinary people and not just extraordinary people when that was true. And that is no longer true today. Now look, now, okay, so, hold on. So here's what, here's, here's what, I'm, here's what we're going to do. It's a very, very fair question. Well, how do we make it better? It is. Because I'm you, not inclined to, to agree with much of what it is you've said here, but how do we make it better? That's what I would like to hear. I well, if it doesn't need to be made better, why are you asking the question? No, I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll grant it. I'll, I'll, I, do, you can't say that. You can't have both. Do you want to take a stab at, you know, I'm going to make you king for the next 90 seconds, George. There's some things government could do. Oh, no. Oh. It's, will, his, it's his podium right now. That, that will not transform America, uh, but that would actually restore some measure of of equal opportunity, which is what we've lost in this country. I mean, just broadly, some examples of that. We, we could restore something like the separation of commercial and investment banking, okay, which, talk prevent, about that in your book which, which prevented financial crises for 50 years. Why were there no financial crises from the Great Depression until the SNL crisis? Because we had a well-regulated uh, uh, Wall Street. That's one. I mean, there, I would say we, we could get rid of the, uh, the carried interest loophole, which creates a grossly unfair uh, income tax uh, it, very it would be a very small solution. It would be. It would Affordable be. care act, I assume, there, would be there, something there you would is, say is progress. There is no magic wand, and I, I don't have it. But I, there are small policy things that would make a difference. But you know, one last thing about globalization. If you look at Germany, which is subject to the exact same forces and trends as the United States, somehow Germany has become, you know, it, it's a global economic powerhouse, and it also, it is smaller, but it also has different policies and different ideas about what people in their society 
owe each other and what is a fair distribution. And so they have a strong middle class. They still have unions. They still have manufacturing. Is that absolute? Is that so hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So look, so hold on, hold on. The, 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 mic, the, mic, the microphone's mine. It's late at night. What I really hoped we would do with this would be to have a provocative conversation outside the wheelhouse of the normal things that we talk about. I can't urge all of you in strongly enough to pick up George's book, buy it, ask him to sign it, I read it. I don't think I sold it Think tonight. about it, <laughs> argue with him about it. I think we'll have another drink, all of us. And I want to say to all of you, thanks for your careful attention so late at night. And thank you, George Packer. Okay, thanks. Thank you.